and welcome to another edition of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, a huge episode for me. Check it out. It's Negative Approach Week, and we are wrapping it up with one of the greatest vocalists of all time from the band Negative Approach, from the band Laughing Hyenas, from the band Easy Action, and now finally it can be heard from the band Static, John Brannon is here. And trust me, this is a good one. Uh, Hold on one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, Head over to the email address, turnedoutapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham, and he will get the message to me. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do for this show. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at left for damien If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all your friends about it. Letting, letting your friends know that we have a podcast here where we just talk about punk music and yeah so spread the word that way uh you can also uh subscribe to it and rate it on your platform of choice if you're listening to this on itunes please rate it and thank you to everyone that does do that you can also support it by heading over to patreon.com slash turned at a punk and checking out some of the stuff we do over there thank you thank you to everyone that does do that it's very much appreciated and helps keep this show going and speaking of support this thing would not be possible without the kind support of the fine folks at vans who uh came aboard a few years ago and said damien we like what you're doing don't have to change a thing about it just don't do it out of your own pocket anymore and they let me do this podcast as i see fit and just yeah believe in it support it so i cannot thank them enough for uh looking out for this little guy over here on turn out of punk and uh, speaking of things that we do in our lives, I play in a band. We're called Fucked Up. We will be going on tour with Faith No More. Google Fucked Up Faith No More for more information about these shows. We will also be potentially, hopefully, yes, definitely, heading out a bunch for touring in the new year. Fingers crossed. And uh, we, on, on, in support of the 10th anniversary, I can't believe I'm saying that, of David Comes to Life, a record we put out 10 years ago that is now uh, being reissued by Matador Records. You can find out more information about that reissue over there on the Matador website. Also, our buddy Scotty Karate at Tank Crimes is putting out our hour-and-a-half-long song, Year of the Horse. So find out more information over there at tankcrimesrecords.com, tankcrimes.com. Just Google it, and it'll come up. I promise. And also, I'm very, very, very happy to announce that we are uh, part of the Get Better Records family now, and they will be reissuing, finally, on vinyl, Epics in Minutes, something that only ever came out on CD. And I'm asked if it's ever going to come out on vinyl eh, pretty much at every show. So now I can finally give someone a, a, a concrete answer about when that's going to happen. Uh, and so head over to getbetterrecords.com for more information about that okay on to today's show today on the show my hero my my musical hero john brandon is here now this thing has been a long time coming together and i really have to give a huge thank you to dave buick former guest of the show and also friend of the show because he worked tirelessly to make this happen we we both were working on john from two separate sides, trying to make this thing come together, and it did. So thank you, Dave, for uh, all your help. And as I mentioned off the top, it's out today. If you're listening to this the day it dropped, there is finally a proper release, thanks to Third Man, of the infamous Static recordings. Now, Static is this band. We talked about this in the episode, so I'm not going to you know, rehash it for you now. You'll hear about it in a second. But this thing has existed in my imagination for like 20 some odd years at this point, like just thinking about this thing and like wondering what it's going to sound like. And when, when I first got a chance to hear it, I was, I was shaking. I'm not going <laughs> to, I, I really was because it was just, I've wanted to hear this thing for so long and here it is. And I don't, I don't want to overhype it to you, but for me, oh my gosh, did this thing live up to the hype? Uh, it's a perfect kind of gateway to the world that is John Brannon. You know, he is, 
this voice that, you know, as someone who has an aggressive vocal in a hardcore punk band or, you know, an aggressive vocal period, I think a lot of people malign it, you know, and a lot of people think it's just yelling into a microphone. And when you hear the way that John does it, and there's definitely other vocalists that also take it to different places, but John, when you hear John do it, you really do see how it's an art form. And to watch him develop his voice from static to negative approach to laughing hyenas and right to the day in easy action, like just seeing him kind of take this instrument and I don't know, just add depth to it and just, I don't know, I'm, I could go on forever. I could go on forever and I'm not going to because why hear me blather on about John's voice when you can actually hear John's voice. But before I let you hear this episode, I should tell you that in addition to the static record coming out, Negative Approach have also put out the Tied Down demos. The complete demo was put out by Tang Records for Record Store Day, and I believe there's still copies floating around and, and available. Uh, this thing is also definitely worth hearing and sounds way better than the bootlegs that I have of this recording uh, prior to getting the copy of this thing. And also, in in a couple weeks, the reissue of the Negative Approach 7-inch will be finally hitting the streets. It's going to be on... Green vinyl this time, but there will be new cover art. It's not going to be the same cover as the last reissue from 2010. So everyone that complains, do not worry. There's there's different cover art, and this thing looks fucking awesome. Uh, yeah. If I didn't already own several copies of this thing, I would probably be ordering it right now. Ah, who am I kidding? I'm probably going to still wind up ordering it. You know, just I wonder what it sounds like when it's on green vinyl. Those are the other questions that will... Uh, lead my children to have to deal with a lot of records and get rid of a lot of records when I die. But anyway, that's morbid. Let's stay positive right now because John Brandon is here. All right. I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy John Brandon on Turned Out a Punk. <laughs> John, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, man. We've been blowing this off for a long time. I'm glad we could do it. Well, as I've told you before, man, you're my Sinatra. So this is like a, a dream episode for me to get to do because, you know, it's like one thing to do it in like one legendary band, but you have done it time and time again. And I think with this static record that's coming out, it really shows that you've been here in punk since its inception and been here the whole way through. So, yeah, we got a lot to talk about. Okay. <laughs> but I got to start this off the way they all start off, which is, John, how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre? Well, you know, I, you know, I was into music before punk. So I kind of, you know, when I was kind of getting into music, you know, it was kind of like, you know, you know, the beginning, you know, early 70s, uh, you know, hard rock, you know, glam rock. I mean, you know, locally, you know, it was Alice Cooper, MC5, Stooges. So to me, that was punk before I even knew, you know, the term punk. But, uh, you know, just, you know, just being from Michigan, that was, you know, I just thought that was the norm. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you know to be into, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, in the early 70s. So um, as far as punk, you know, you know, when it first started coming out, you know, the Sex Pistols, seeing the photos and then, you know, hearing those records, you know. The Static used to cover the Pistols. We did. I mean, I mean, well, you know, we started kind of around 78, you know, we had those albums. We, you know, we had the damned and the clash and generation X and, uh, yeah, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, the dead boys, which we were really into, you know? So, but, but like I said, you know, you know, you know, the kind of, you know, the, you know, you know, the harder edge glam rock and stuff we, you know, to us, that was, you know, that was punk, you know, mm -hmm. before, you know, before the term got slapped on it, you know? So where were you kind of hearing about this stuff? Because, you know, obviously it's happening locally with a lot of the Detroit rock stuff. But I mean, like in terms of the punk records, was it through like magazines or is there a radio seeing, station? Yeah, magazine, you know, Cream Magazine, you know, just seeing the photos. And then, you know, there was all this hot, you know, you know, we'd always, you know, buy the magazines, the rock magazines. And then, you know, there'd be early, you know, rock scene and, you know, you know, uh, well, you know, Cream, sir, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, they start, you know, start showing the photos of them and stuff. And then we're like, wow, this is like totally different. This is crazy. And then I remember that, you know, there used to be this radio station late night. They're like, we've just got a, you know, a UK pressing of the, the Sex Pistols album. And they played it at like midnight or something. 
Uh, you know, I was in high school. I stayed up and listened to it. it you know, it, it really wasn't that shocking. You know, it was never mind the Bullocks. And I'm like, you know, this sounds like a faster version of Mott the Hoople. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, because you know, it was kind of, you know, laced in, you know, the, you know, the Chuck Berry riffs and, you know, it wasn't that shocking. I mean, you know, I think, I think, you know, maybe more like the photos and the images of uh, kind of what was going on, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, we heard that, you know, and of course, you know, well, we, you know, you know, you know, I was past my, you know, you know, kissing Aerosmith, you know, it was kind of like, well, this kind of sucks. And, you know, <laughs> you know, it was new and exciting, you know, you know, and we, you know, we were all obsessed with it, you know, for a couple of years. So we, you know, decided that was kind of stupid too. You know, we're like, you know, the Sex Pistols are kiss. You know, <laughs> I mean, you get a little older and then you get into other things. So, uh. but you kind of need that cartoonish presentation to get you into something as a kid. Like that's why I think Kiss is so successful is because they have that kind of like Saturday morning cartoon comic book feel. I was, to them. you know, I was fifteen. I was going to those gigs. Actually, the first, you know, like arena gig I ever saw is when they recorded that live album. Oh, awesome. When they, or when they claim they recorded, because <laughs> years later you found out there was five different gigs and massive overdubbings. But, you know, when I was 15, you know, at that point, you know, Alice Cooper was kind of, you know, you know, getting a little, you know, Hollywood squares and kind of like, you know, that, that kind of came up. And that, you know, as a 15-year-old, you know, seeing those album covers, it was kind of cool. And then, uh, yeah, I was actually my first like arena gig seeing that it was supposedly one of the nights that, you know, they recorded uh, Kiss Alive. Was that the first time you ever saw live music, though? That was my no, not. Well, we might want to go back to 1969. My actual first gig. Yeah. What was your first gig? Judy Collins. <laughs> <laughs> my sister was it was like an outdoor venue. This place called Meadowbrook. I think that was my first exposure to weed. <laughs> you know, you know, it's kind of the thing where, you know, the family set up the blankets and the picnic tables and it's like the amphitheater. My sister was really into Judy Collins. And, you know, I think I was about eight or, you know, I was probably about eight, maybe seven, eight, you know. And, you know, I kept smelling all this smell and I was like, Dad, what's that smell? He goes, don't worry about that, son. <laughs> you know, so that was my first exposure to like, you know, like hippies. And, you know, I was pretty straight laced, you know, being the minister's kid and you know, you know, but you know, I was, you know, I was excited, you know, seeing a stage with PAs and, you know, well, yeah, okay, Judy Collins, that was my first <laughs> actual gig. That's awesome. Stay away from that stuff, son. You want none of that. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you don't want any part of this, son. <laughs> so, I was, yeah, it was just, a, you know, it's like, you know, I think, you know, for anybody, the first time they smell weed, it's like, what the hell is this, man? Yeah, 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 yeah you know. Uh, so where'd you kind of, uh, when was the first time you heard any of that sort of like Detroit stuff? Like when was the first time you heard the Stooges or the MC five? Was it played on the radio well, or is there any sort of like cultural awareness yeah, larger? You know, maybe some late night, you know, they, the word alternative wasn't there, but, uh, I gotta, you know, just being local, you'd always hear about, you know, you know, Al, at this point, Alice Cooper was still a local band. You know, they, they lived in town when, you know, they were doing love it to death and killer. So that, that was more like in the press because that was more of a media thing. But, you know, like, you know, early uh, Cream magazines just seen pictures of Viggy. I never actually heard the records till you know, I hung out, you know, with one of my friends and kind of got into their Big Brothers records and be like, <laughs> who's this dude? You know, you know. And then um, I got to say, kick out the jams. They, they did play that on the radio, but it was the clean. It was the brothers and sisters. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of the motherfuckers version to like later on when I bought the albums, you know, but uh, they did kind of play in rotation, kick out the jams. It was like, uh, used to be at this radio station called CKLW, which actually broke Alice Cooper with 18. And that was kind of like, they had the biggest broadcasting tower. So it was kind of like, kind of covered all the Midwest, but it was, um, it was actually based in Windsor across the street, you know, the bridge where you, oh, you're from Canada, Windsor. Yep. But, but it had this big broadcasting, uh, you know, signal that went all around the Midwest. So, you know, they'd play kick out the jams. Brothers and sisters, you know, you know we were like, this is great. You know, you know, this is great. So when did you start going to, like, after, I guess, that first arena showed you with Kiss, did you start going to shows kind of on the reg at that I point? Was, I, was kind of, when I was about 15. I was sneaking into venues and going and see bands play, you know, like, uh, god man i gotta say like destroy all monsters they'd oh, be awesome. playing there was a local club down the block for me called the red carpet 
So, you know, at that point, you know, I had the long hair and, the, you know, the leather jacket. So uh, I kind of just sneak in the back door and I could catch gigs like that, you know? Yeah. And, you know, whatever local rock thing was going on. So, you know. So was that kind of the scene at that point, Destroy All Monsters? Because it's kind of like in between, you know, your scene and, and of course, the gotta, Detroit rock scene. Locally, you know, you know, and, and kind of seeing those gigs like really early on, uh, you know, kind of sneaking into those shows. Uh, the only cool bands, you know, it was kind of like Sonic Rendezvous Band and mm-hmm. Destroy All Monsters. And then you had all the spinoff bands that were just like crap. I mean, it was falling into the, you know, the 1978, 79, all these bands were claiming they were punk and it was just, you know, them do, you know, just, it, it was horrible. I mean, there was nothing that crazy and I wouldn't even, you know, consider like destroy all monsters or Sonic rendezvous band punk. They were just like dudes that were heroes from bands. We already dug mm-hmm. what they were doing at that point. You know, they got kind of labeled into that thing. There wasn't anything kind of crazy going on. And I, and I got to say like 78, 79, you know, punk was still, you know, a four letter word it was, you know you don't want to go there you don't want to know about that so that's that's kind of like right when we started kind of doing gigs as static you know kind of breaking into that and we were like underage you know trying to play the clubs and shit and uh you know just i mean i, I mean you know punk is so accepted now they play it you know you know they played in elevators now in grocery stores but uh at that point you know it was still kind of like a, you know it's weird dangerous thing i guess what's like the first punk gig you remember happening like that was actually like being called like a punk show in detroit like real like well or even being marketed you know as, as like a punk show type thing new wave or whatever when i when i could first start kind of getting into bars it just uh like good stuff would be like you know like in high school seeing the dead boys yeah or D- devo yeah which i'd go see all the time I mean, I mean, those, you know, I got to say, those are probably the first couple gigs. And then, you know, then I saw the Ramones and, you know, you know, that, you know, to me that, you know, those are punk gigs. Absolutely. Know. What about the Pagans? Like, was there any sort of connection with the never, Cleveland never scene? saw the Pagans. I know they played Detroit at Bookies a couple of times. I wasn't aware of who the Pagans were mm-hmm. until I met the Necros and they had, you know, they're from Ohio. They had all those 45s. I, I were, really wasn't aware of the Pagans to like, I got to say like 81, you know, when the Necro, you know, I started hanging out with the Necros and, you know, they played me those records. Sorry. It's amazing how regional it was until hardcore where you have like scenes traveling around and interacting with each other. But prior to that, like short, short of bands, like showing up and playing somewhere, there's not really, it doesn't seem like the network's really established until, you know, you're kind of like the hardcore era really kicks It was off. a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause all those bands, you know, they'd play with each other and be in touch with each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you know, at that point, you know, I was still, you know, too young to get into the clubs, you know. Well, how did Static come together? Kind of, kind of, you know, I just, you know, I had, a, I had another band when I was 15 called Fallout. And that was kind of like, you know, battle the bands, you know, uh, you know, just kind of doing, you know, the basic 70s rock covers. That was my first experience kind of singing with the band. Uh, they actually had two originals and they were already kind of formed and I kind of like, came in as the lead to the bass pair was singing before that. And, you know, they're doing like Hendrix covers and, you know, you know, cinnamon girl by, you know, the Neil young, Neil young. Yeah. And that, you know, um, I kind of came in and started singing with them and that was kind of, you know, like a battle of the bands, like a, like a backyard kegger, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, so that was my kind of first experience. And then I can't remember, I think they kicked me out. Yeah. I'm always getting kicked out of bands because they always say like, you know, we're looking for a better singer, John. John is, uh, um, that, that blows my mind because, as I say, you're like you're like my vocal hero, and it's it's funny because like hearing the static stuff that came out, like I'm really intrigued now to hear the Fallout stuff because it's almost. You know, I, I I know we made one tape, and I I haven't talked to those dudes in like you know 40, 45 years. So I mean, you know, the drummer might have like the one demo tape we made. It was songs they wrote and handed me the lyric sheet. So, I mean, it was pretty, uh, it was very 70s rock. Yeah. I mean, there was no element of punk. I remember, you know, I, you know, I was still in that band at 77 in high school. And I think the punkiest thing we did, um, it was right when the first Cheap Trick album came out. And I had to beg those guys 
to to like learn a cover of uh he's a whore yeah. and they're like oh, i don't know about this punk shit man <laughs> you know it was like one of those but that's about the punkiest we got yeah that you know you know he's a whore yeah <laughs> so they wanted to do like zeppelin covers and hendrix covers and and then it kind of got like you know my inch I, I i'm pretty sure they kicked me out like john you know you're you're on a different path here so at that point i was just like all right i'm you know i'm in high school and now i'm like i gotta find like you know some people to jam with you know they're in you know on this wavelength you know you know because you know the punk thing was just coming out and like i said you know there's like you know like four punks in my high school i mean yeah i mean you know you know the jocks would want to beat you up if you you know mm-hmm. said oh i'm into punk i mean at that point you know i still had the long ass fucking hair and shit and you know the last you know i kind of dress in the same way i have since i've been 15 but uh you know you know I, you know I, I guess i look like you know like a 70s burnout you know you know still <laughs> but you know i was into punk and uh had to find you know people that were like-minded and wanted to jam so you know i think i was like 17 and then i found this kid he was like 15 and and you know because i was like asking everybody in school who plays guitar who plays guitar and they're like billy plays guitar but you know at that point you know he wasn't into punk at all he had no inkling what it was he was into like hendrix and basically hendrix you know, yeah. you know i mean he was a little virtuoso and shit so I remember I started hanging out. I go, we got to form a band and we're going to write songs. Cause it, you know, I was like, we got to get away from this cover shit. I was really, you know, determined at a young age to like, you know, we got to write songs, man. We got to, you know, take this to the next level, you know? So, you know, he was, like I said, he was all obsessed with Hendrix and, you know, you know, guitar virtuosity and all this shit. So, you know, I loaned him uh you know, I figured I, I, I go, this guy can totally fucking play. And he wants, he wants to form a band and write songs. So I kind of gave him a crash course in punk. I handed him, you know, first Sex Pistols album, first Damned album, and, uh, you know, the first Generation X album and the Dead Boys album, you know, Young Allowance stuff. I go, I go, learn this. This is what we're going to do. And then, and he really liked the Dead Boys and he really liked Generation X. And, you know, he liked the pistols, you know, he liked the other shit too. Yeah, but, yeah. He really liked Generation X because, you know, they kind of had their own thing going on. So, you know, out of that kind of came like, you know, we kind of just started trying to write songs. And, you know, you know, we practiced every day in my mother's basement after fucking school late at night. The cops would come all the time because he had like a Marshall <laughs> stack and Big Muff and, uh, you know. You know, I, you know, I was living in Girls Point Park, which is a pretty reserved, you know, straight laced, uh, you know, neighborhood. You know, we lived like a block away from Detroit, you know, on the east side. And, uh, you know, the cops would come every night. And it would just it would just be me and him just, you know, just jamming all night. And, uh, you know, neighbors calling the cops every night. And, you know, we kind of, you know, we started writing some riffs. And, and, I, and I think the first couple songs that we actually wrote were like, you know, there were actually song songs were, you know, toothpaste and pills and punk nation. Mm-hmm. So those are, you know, those are my first attempts at, uh, actually had, well, actually having like a finished song <laughs> where, you know, I had, you know, lyrics and a concept. So those were kind of like, you know, my life's a TV show. Those they hold all- up though. Like that for like, those are your first attempts at writing those songs. Those songs rip. Like that's the thing about this record. I had built it up so much in my mind because it was legendary. The, the, the static recording. I remember there was talk of Thurston putting it out way back when I remember that was a rumor. That that, was gonna... that, well, that kind of came up, uh, you know, that was, you know, I was hanging out with the necros and when I first met the necros and uh, you know, we started, you know, hanging out with them and starting to go to the shows. I was still in static when I, you know, when I first met those guys and yeah. I think gave like Todd or Barry, you know, like one of the basement tapes, one of the demo tapes that might, you know, pr- probably had some of those versions of the songs that ended up on the album. Cause, you know, I got boxes of tapes, you know, 10 versions of toothpaste and pills. And anyway, I get, you know, I go, this is our demo, man. Cause you know, that was the thing back in the day, you know, having an eight by 10 glossy and a demo tape, man. Cause that's how you got a gig, man. <laughs> so, you know, you know, so I, I, I gave them a tape. And then, like years later, I think it was Barry. Um, he gave Thurston. You know, I was in the you know the highness at this point, and um, 
I think he gave Thurston a dub of the demo. And then, and then, you know, you know, Sonic Youth and the Hyenas were kind of hooked up doing gigs. And Thurston's like, God, I really want to put out that that static tape. And I'm like, what? You got the static tape? I was kind of embarrassed. You know, it's kind of like one of those things. Uh, you know, you know, after negative approach and starting laughing, I was I'm like, you know, you know, I, I, I got a serious music career going now, and I'm trying to, you know, write meaningful songs. And you know, static was always like, you know, that skeleton in my closet. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to know about because I was pretty embarrassed about it. You know, you know, kind of coming out of a glam rock thing and then, you know, discovering hardcore and then, you know, you know, realizing everything that I have done is wrong. <laughs> and this is what I want to do. You know, after see, you know, like Black Flag with Dez. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you know like early DOA gigs and uh you know, you know, uh, you know, necros. I was like, wow, man, everything I'm doing is wrong. This is this is stupid, man. You know, and then you know that I, I figured, you know, I can do that, you know, that's what I want to do. But um, oh, any just anyway, uh Thurston got the tape, and then you know, he's like, Man, I want to put this out on a static piece. And I was like, Oh no, oh no, 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 no. I go, We're we're not opening that can of worms. And then he kept bugging me. He goes, No, man, this stuff's really good, man. And I, I, you know, I'd kind of race that whole part of my life out of in my mind, you know, so, so that never came about. I was just like, you know, I was adamant. I was like, no, man, this is never happening. Nobody's ever going to know about this. So, you know, that kind of came up at one point. And, uh, you know, like I said, all the tapes and the photos all got stuck in a box and locked in my mother's uh, basement for like, you know, 40 years to like, uh, you know, well, just a, a, a thing that came up is like it was a couple of years ago. We were on tour. Easy Action was on tour with Dinosaur Junior, and uh, we uh, they they were going to it was the Nashville branch of that, and they they, they were going in there to like cut some like live forty five for Dinosaur Junior. So mm-hmm. while we were there, uh, Ben Blackwell, you know the guy who runs it there, um, you know he's giving us a tour of you know Third Man and showing us you know his amazing you know Stooges collection and then. He opens up this thing. It's like a bank vault. He goes, these are the Jack White tapes. And then, you know, we started talking. I go, God damn, you got, you, you got all his fucking tapes. We got, and he's like, yeah, we got every, you know, tape he's ever done since he was, you know, in his bedroom with the cassette recorder. And then we started talking about tapes. And then he's like, he goes, you know what, John, you got, you, you got to break out those, those static tapes, you know, because he grew up, you know, kind of right near, you know, on the east side in gross point he, he was a few blocks away from me back in the day and uh and I, you know it was another thing like oh no 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 i can't do that man it's too embarrassing i can't i can't bring this can't bring this to life <laughs> uh, okay a couple years go by i'm kind of you know leslie and i get you know we got a new house in ferndale so I, you know i started transferring all my you know my records and all my kind of rock and roll stuff that i've had stashed in my mom's basement for years so kind of came across the static tapes and it broke those open. It was during, you know, during lockdown, I had a lot of time. I was like, eh, you know, I'll crack a beer and check this stuff out. And then I started listening to it and I was like, whoa, this isn't, this isn't that bad. And then, it, you know, it was kind of, you know, kind of like as time went on, I guess, well, I guess, you know, cause I, I, I would never listen to that shit and started listening to it. And then I was thinking about what Blackwell said, like, Oh, so you know that you know eventually i made like a comp tape for third man i made him a couple tapes of just you know picking out songs here and there so mm-hmm. i sent that to them and they're like oh we totally want to put this out and i was like really <laughs> so you know then it got to a point like i started finding more tapes you know every you know everything was on cassette so i think i sent them like you know like five 90 minute tapes completely filled with stuff you know and uh they kind of gave it to their their sound guy, uh, Warren DeFever. You know, they, they kind of like you know, you know, uh, you know, put it on the computer and all that stuff. And then we kind of, you know, we kind of narrowed it down. And then we started listening to the stuff, and they're like, "Oh, there's totally an album here." You know, if, you know, we pick and choose the songs. So, uh, you know, we kind of narrowed it down to like the best of what we had. Not necessarily the best performance, but you know, the best sounding quality cassette I happen to have, and what do we narrow it down to about 12 tracks and there's a seven inch too well i'm including that oh, yeah I, yeah I, can't, I, I don't know how many songs are on the album like i think, I think it's 14 with the seven inch 
Oh, it's that many? Yeah, just, I, mean, I don't, I don't know the count. Okay, yeah, I don't we, have kind of, we kind of narrowed it down to the best of what we had. Yeah, and then, you know, you know, it's, it, you know, it's crazy that third man would want to put this out. Well, it makes yeah. sense, right? Like this to me is like, this is the Rosetta Stone. You know, like this thing is like the way to understand. Like you're, I know you're like, you don't like the fact that this, but to me, this is the perfect bridge between that early punk Detroit stuff and then this hardcore stuff that, of course, negative approach would kind of like bring to the world you know but this to me is like uh i don't know like a key document it makes sense that third man's putting it especially with the detroit connection obviously like i mean you know i'm surprised you know that third man would want to put out a record with just you know vocals guitar and drums <laughs> i don't, I don't know why pretty, i thought that was pretty brave on their part <laughs> yeah, definitely that, 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 I, don't, I don't know if that concept's been done before they, 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 they might... basically say si, well we didn't have a bass player <laughs> you know you know so i was just kind of like you know the drummer you know billy on guitar and you know you know me singing you know you know we didn't have a bass player for the first year we couldn't get we auditioned people or you know we put out ads in the paper you know looking for a punk bass player you know you know yeah. the Detroit news and all that stuff you could you know you know put uh you know the classifieds you know musicians wanted i mean we we were on the mad search for anybody to play bass but as soon as you said you wanted to be in a punk band People are like, oh, I don't want to do that shit, man. And then, uh, you know, it was it was this guy, Mike Neal, that actually lived across the street from me. And he's actually the guy that kind of taught me how to play guitar when I was like 15 and stuff. And he was all, you know, him, him and his brother, um, Steve Neal, who does a bunch of backup vocals on the record. And, uh, you, know, uh, they, you know, they would come over and party and watch us all the time, you know, drink beer and stuff. And they, you know, they'd always like laugh at us, make fun of us, and be like, "Oh, you guys, man! Oh, you guys, you guys suck! You guys, you guys, are ne- you know, you guys are never going to do anything with this." So, just about a year later, you know, we couldn't find a bass player. So I finally convinced Mike to play bass. You know, he's like, "I don't want to play that punk shit, Brandon. Like, you guys suck anyway." So you know, just a lot of like, "Come on, man! You're over here every night watching us." you know you know making fun of us why don't you play bass because because he was like a you know a lead guitar player and he was all you know his shit was like hendrix and the stones and mm-hmm. you know i mean he was you know he's in alice cooper and the stooges and all that but he he, he, he kind of like laughed at the whole punk thing he was just like oh this shit's ridiculous and you know you know he's into classic rock or whatever so we finally got him to play bass so at that point you know you know beyond playing you know the house parties in my mom's basement you know, which we did for a year. We'd have all the neighborhood kids come over and, you know, you know, it's just kind of like little mini concerts in my mom's basement. Um, House shows, the punk staple. That, that's what it was, man. It's like, you know, you know, you know, oh, let's go over to Brandon's house, man. You can party over there, you know? Yeah. And, you know, then we have the house parties. And like I said, the cops would come. The cops came to our house so many for- so many times i can't even tell you how many times they shut us down they tried <laughs> they tried to end us before we could even do anything so i mean you know then we got mike to play bass and then it was like then we started kind of you know started trying to get bar gigs and started you know actually kind of playing around the local places you know you know bookies and nunzios and the red carpet and we actually played you know we actually did gigs at like the freezer theater yeah, yeah, that's what I saw in the recording. There's like a recording you know, from there. Well, at that point, it was just kind of like a poetry hippie venue, you know, like a folk place. You know, this was before, it was before you know, the hardcore thing took it over, mm-hmm. you know, claimed that as a, its own. But, uh, you know, we play all the particular songs and we never really, there was only a few gigs where we actually got to play our whole set, you know, because we'd usually do toothpaste and pills around the fourth song. So... And that would shut it down. Well, you know, we we had the stage show. You know, <laughs> yeah. where, you know I, I would come out and, uh, you know, be wearing my mother's uh, polka dot raincoat. And, you know, we had makeup on and, you know, I, you know, I, you know, my black, you know, I'm trying to be Alice Cooper type look. And, you know, you know, we couldn't really afford like, uh, you know, like stage wear to have, you know, the boots like kiss or, you know, or anything. So I would spray paint her like black shoes, like silver and be like, oh, this is punk. And I, have, you know, one of my dad's old suit coats on, or like I said, one of my mother's raincoats and, you know, a lot, lots of makeup. And, uh, you know, you know, I come out with my tubes of toothpaste and squeeze it all over the place. 
you know but that was like so threatening for the clubs it was like we'd usually get to about that song it, you know the chorus toothpaste and pills you know they you know i'd squeeze the toothpaste all over the place and you know i that, that was just so threatening to detroit you know we just thought it was funny you know, we wrote that song, you know, you know, it really means nothing. I just kind of want, you know, there's a couple of words I put together, you know, toothpaste and pills, crimson and clover, you know, you know, rebel, rebel, you know, I was trying to write yeah. some, you know, frustrated teen anthem. Cause that was all, you know, coming out of the glam thing, you know, all the teenage anthems and, you know, you know, the Alice Cooper thing, you know, we need to write a teenage anthem that, you know, the, you know, disaffected youth can relate to man. The outsiders, you know, that was my that was my whole goal to write, you know, some kind of anthem. And so, you know, whatever we you know, we come out and you know, do toothpaste and pills, and you know, they'd shut us down four songs. You know, the cops would come, they, you know, they call the cops on us because they're like, You guys caused, you know, you ruined our monitors, man. You guys will never play here again. So every time, you know, we'd show up at a club and be like, Oh no, it's that toothpaste man. <laughs> <laughs> like and it was kind of like the nwa thing if you guys do fuck the police uh tonight we're gonna shut you down it, it, it literally got to a thing like if you guys do that toothpaste song tonight we're pulling you off stage so you know we always took it as a threat and we we always just did it you know so it, it, and it, you know it's a tube of toothpaste you know i throw like you know bottles of bare aspirin in you know you know to compensate for the pill part so i'd throw aspirin at the audience and uh have a couple tubes of toothpaste and uh you know, you know make my mess and you know squeeze it all over me you know you know you know you know you know that, that was our stage show we didn't have a lot of money we could go to the drugstore and buy a couple tubes of toothpaste and you know some aspirin and it, it, it caused havoc in detroit i mean i gotta say at that point uh it, it was a threat and we, we were just laughing you know well because it kicks off really early in detroit obviously because of the detroit rock stuff but even like the punk thing like there's a lot of early punk bands there's also like the romantics and the reruns and that sort of power we, pop stuff we, we go see all those bands they play down the block there's this place called the red carpet and the, all those you know there was you know there was the rockets mm -hmm. and there was romantics and you know there was the cubes and you know cold cock and uh out of out of all those kind of bands that were, were kind of like in that scene, the only the only really kind of eh, you know bands that have records out of that point, you know, we do gigs with uh, you know cult heroes, yeah, Nikki and the Corvettes. I mean, you know, be on that level, and we, you know, you know, in the back of our mind, our you know our seventeen year old, you know, we're the best band in the world. You know, we'd be like these guys suck. You know, and we'd always put you know the cult heroes stuff. You know, they thought we were cute. So we actually did, you know, some, you know, high Hiawatha was like, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny Static. You know, you know, you know, you know, so they were the, you know, like kind of like the first kind of bands that were kind of, you know, you know, labeled as that punk thing going on at that point that, you know, would actually ask us back to play with them, you know. What about bands like the Ivories and Cinecide and, and that whole Tremor all Records that stuff? stuff was going on, but, you know, I got it, you know, I thought I was, you know. You know, just just because they played just because it was the time frame like 78 79 they all claimed they were punk mm -hmm. and i'm listening to this stuff i go man this is like watered down like you know power pop or you know you know you had like the mutants and stuff and i go mm -hmm. you know these dudes are doing you know animal covers and thinking it's like you know you know you know because you'd read about them later in new york rocker and be like oh you know you know punk explosion you know come you know they were they were kind of the first bands that had 45s out like local 45s so you know they got the exposure but you know we saw all those bands and we're like nah no nah, like, we're better you know you know we always had that attitude you know well because i like i do think the recordings are awesome was there ever talk of like putting out records on tremor or spider records or anything no, man nobody wanted anything to do with us man mm -hmm. we were like you know you know, we were that toothpaste band. Like I said, like I said, we barely made it through any show where we didn't get pulled off stage and like, you guys need to leave now. Now, just we we don't we don't like your punk shit. And you know, we didn't, you know, we we're, we're looking like glam rockers, you know, we we're still kind of holding on to that. We were kind of, you know, holding on to the glam thing, you know, because we, you know, because punk was, you know, in our eyes was just coming out and we were discovering that. Mm -hmm. So, you know. You know, we try to maybe try to, you know, look like Alice Cooper or the dolls or something, but you know, 
we're playing a little harder than any of these people you know we're you know we're, we're more like in tune with you know the dead boys and you know that kind of sound well were there any bands that were kind of playing around then that you did feel a kinship to like i mean prior well, to like the hardcore no stuff. no <laughs> no <laughs> we thought they all sucked we thought they, like i said the only bands that i appreciated were uh destroy all monsters and sonic rendezvous band they're the only bands where i was like okay this is good you know these this is cool but like i said i really didn't consider that punk mm. like i said you know these are members of heroes of bands i was in they were good though they mm -hmm. were you know their, their style they played but that to me that was the only interesting thing going on you know did, did static and na overlap because static goes to like 81 right uh There's recordings on the record from 81 i think the latest recording it's funny because the last static show was uh july i think coronation tavern in windsor we used to play there all the time because they you know you know you know they've let us play and the, you know they actually liked us you know because we'd smash bottles and stuff that was kind of like you know canadian thing you could you know get you know, our stage show I'd, I'd always be breaking glass and you know you know you know trying to you know be crazy or whatever the canadians like that shit <laughs> they'd, they'd all be drunk going yeah man you know you know you know um it, it was kind of like towards the end of static like i said you know i was already kind of hanging out with the necros and stuff and then you know you know you know towards the end you know my guitar player is like well you know jb uh you know i think i'm looking for a better singer man he, he just he didn't like the direction i was going in you know because i was getting you know started hanging out with the necros and they started you know playing me the la stuff and you know you know the first you know the first dudes who played me like you know the germs and uh you know you know the black flag and the weirdos you know you know and then you know um you know you know i was hanging out with them a lot he didn't he didn't like that and i'd met larissa and tasco also kind of like hipping me you know to this whole other world that i wasn't aware of and then, uh um i don't i i already been hanging out with pete zaleski who was the original bass player you know because he went to my high school so uh we were already talking about we got to start something new and the, the guitar player wanted to fire me you know they, they always want to fire me like uh, you know we, i need to find you know somebody a little more melodic you know i was trying yeah it was right when i was developing my voice trying to get a little harder and he wasn't you know and i was like we we need to be more punk and you know his his whole deal was like i think my guitar solo should be longer <laughs> you know, he wanted to show his talents and i go no man we need to write songs with no guitar solos so I, at that point i kind of had the nucleus what you know what i wanted to do for negative approach so and it was kind of like uh i gotta say I, I think static was still going on towards the end and then and, and then we saw black flag with des at bookies and, it, and you know i think Pete talks about it in the liner notes mm -hmm. we drove home that night and we knew static was over and then i think we had that one one gig booked that you know there's a couple tracks on the album from that last show which you can kind of see you know is a little harder you know you know than the earlier tracks but uh you know just you know you know just becoming aware of what you know you know to me that was something new and exciting that i could probably be a part of and uh you know it was young people doing it and it was just stripped down you know really raw music i was really attracted to that so you know at that point you know that static was over you know you know i was going in a different direction you know it, it feels like there's almost like a complete changing of the guard that happens in the scene like there's like you know in that in uh the documentary Otto's documentary no yeah. uh, there's like almost like a hard stop and everyone talks about how you're like one of the few people that kind of like crossed over i guess pete as well but like there are very few people that kind of cross over it's like a new scene that starts up were there other people that you remember at the time kind of like getting into it with you guys or is it really just you guys kind of like crossing well over? i gotta say static we had maybe like five people that would follow us around yeah i mean i mean we i can't really say we had an audience i mean you know it was just basically like showing up and playing with some other established band and getting thrown off stage and <laughs> You kid, you kids never come back now. You, you know, you know, it was like that. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't any kind of, you know, you know, kind of like felt like there was a group of people kind of 
you know, till I, you know, started hanging out with the Necros and Tesco and Larissa. And then at that point, I got to say there was about 10 of us, you know, what, you know, became the nucleus of, uh, you know, the freezer scene and the, you know, the early hardcore scene. It, it started out really small. And I got to say, you know, you know, the band that brought everybody together for this new, you know, you know, what was about to happen, you know, was the Necros, you know, because they, they were developing an audience. We were part of that, you know. Yeah. So it all, it all kind of formed out of that. It was really the Necros coming to Detroit in causing chaos and mix, you know, p- you know, pissed it off all the same people that static played with. So I felt a like kinship with them. And I was like, wow, these guys are, these guys are younger than me. And they're, they're so tight and they got a real band. And, you know, then it was a point, you know, they got a record out, you know? So, you know, I started hanging out with them and I, you know, was lucky enough to, you know, you know, you know, be involved with, you know, the early touch and go thing and, you know, have them, you know, you know, release a record and stuff. So, you know, I was real fortunate to meet them. And, you know, you know, that was the new, you know, 81 kind of the nucleus of, uh, you know, what became the hardcore scene. And like you wrote that first seven inch on guitar in like the course of a weekend, right? I think I remember reading that in Tony's book. I, a bunch of those tunes. Yeah. I had this shitty Magnum guitar. Yeah. And I was just learning how to, you know, you know, I was kind of like towards the end of, that was another thing that broke up static when I could finally, you know <laughs> establish a song yeah the guitar player got really pissed when i'd be like billy i wrote i wrote this tune and he'd always act like he didn't know how to uh, i don't know how to play this man <laughs> i go dude this is like three chords man you you, you do hendrix solos I told him you can't play this he got really offended that, uh i started writing songs that's when the so, singer gets power when they learn so, to pick up the guitar I, you know, I always get that with the bands. They're like, John, man, I, I don't know if I can play this riff. I get that with the hyenas sometimes too. I'd come up with a bass line and Kevin would be like, oh, I don't know if I can play this. I go, what are you talking about? You don't know how to play this. <laughs> they, you know, they get really offended when it's not their shit. And somebody says like, check out this riff. But um, yeah, just the, the the nucleus of you know, that first CP, it really... Yeah, I just I, like the early stuff, you know, like Sick of Talk and, uh, uh, you know, negative, the song Negative Approach and Pressure and all that stuff. Yeah, I just, dude, I just, when I really could like kind of master the bar chord and uh, just sit down and put the cassette player, I, I, those songs just popped out of my head, you know, like yeah. real quick, real quick, you know. And I guess like the, the things that really stand out about that, like, obviously it's a classic, but I think the things that stand out is obviously your voice. But then the other thing is like, you've got this sort of, you know, British second wave, British street punk, oi, I guess prior to being called classified oi, really influence in all this stuff too. Like that's kind of there. Where, you get, where were you getting into that stuff from? Like, the- just, oh, God, I gotta say, you know, just really first hit us, I guess that first oi, the album. Yeah. And then, you know, the Blitz stuff and then just the, the early Discharge singles. But, I mean, that goes back to, like, uh, you know, you know, you know, the first Sex Pistols album. You know, when mm-hmm. I probably first started to sing, I probably, you know, trying to do that Johnny Rotten snarl. And then, then I try to get away from that because I'm like, I'm not English. But, you know, that was kind of instilled in my brain because, you know, we, you know, we played the hell out of that album and kind of having that overtone. But, uh you know, it was, you know, the sham 69. I remember, I, you know, I remember I had, uh, you know, that's life, you know, you know, that's when I was in static, you know, still, you know, uh, Harry, up, Harry, come on, you know, come on, yeah. you know, all that stuff. We love that shit. You well, know, that's a, that stuff's amazing too. And it's just like, it's, it, it's, it's so, I think like that's the power of negative approach is your voice with this sort of like, you know, anthemic, punk with this sort of energy of american hardcore like i think that's why that record cuts through and remains sort of like like how old is that record you're doing this as a kid and we're still talking about it they're still grown-ass men it's crazy man because we you know we weren't even thinking about it we didn't think we'd be together you know you know six months after you know we were so excited we could even record a record (laughs) yeah you know we're like whoa you know because that was you know the static shit you know it was like you know, you know, before we knew that you could release an independent record, I mean, you know, the train of thought was kind of like, we need to be signed to a record label. I mean, you think about, you know, all the early punk releases, those are all major albums. So yep. we had, we had no kind, con- you know, at that point, we're still kind of naive. We had no, 
you know, well, first of all, we didn't have any money or anything. You know, we didn't know you could put out an independent record. We thought, you know, we thought the deal was like, well, we got to be signed to a label. It, yeah. And of course, there was no interest. <laughs> there was no interest <laughs> in what we were doing. So, you know, just the fact that, you know, you know, it was the beginning, you know, touch and go records, you know, they put out the fix and, you know, the meat men and, you know, you know, necro stuff. So, you know, just to be asked to do that, that was, you know, that was that was exciting as hell and you know we we did that first record we did it in Corey's uh bedroom uh, like on a four track it, you know it's a yeah i mean just you know just the fact that that record's held up and you know considered whatever it is you know we just we just did that in his bedroom on a weekend one weekend just recorded all the songs it's also amazing when you like think about like how small that scene you're talking about with this sort of like you know a dozen person nucleus that inc also incorporates some other bands produce so many classic records and so many classic bands i gotta i got you can't really say detroit so you gotta call it you know the midwest yeah the midwest scene, scene yeah, i guess yeah kind of spread out you know with the meat men and uh you know Next, you know uh, that whole deal i mean um i gotta say you can even go up you know to the l7 you know the early mm -hmm. uh releases uh everybody kind of had their own own sound so it's kind of weird that, you know, you know, you got to say, well, you got to say Michigan, Midwest, whatever, kind of had its own kind of, you know, early, uh, you know, sound that was really interesting. All the bands were, you know, nobody sounded alike. Yeah. We're all kind of doing their own thing. But, you know, it's just crazy to think that people are even, you know, you know, the touch and go sound, the Midwest, you know, the freezer scene, whatever, just, you know, that people still talk about this. Well, yeah, the L7 sounds nothing like the Necros, right? Who sound nothing like you guys, but well, we, would, we would all do shows together. Yeah, right? we'd all do shows together because, like I said, there was only like a handful of us that were kind of like, you know, fighting against, you know, you know, fighting the war against New Wave, and, <laughs> you know, just you know, all the stuff that wasn't, you know, well, and also, it also feels that like a lot of like sort of seemingly disparate worlds kind of would would meet in detroit or detroit would get down with like the dc this the the dc scene and the misfits or you know noise rock or or like weird like birthday party stuff that was coming in as imports like it feels like detroit had like a very sort of broad palette when it came to what was punk or whatever new wave or hardcore it's like when people got a little cooler they're more accepting of that stuff i mean the detroit scene loved loved all the discord stuff mm -hmm. and then you know that you know, that connection kind of, you know, with the Necros and Ian, you know, uh, you know, he uh, produced, uh, you know, their second EP. So, you know, you know, that that was a big groundbreaking gig, you know, when Minor Threat came to town. Uh, um, you know, at that point, we already had negative approach together and stuff. And uh, for about like two months, you know, we had, you know, Static was over, and, you know, but uh, they, they, they came and played Windsor, you know, Coronation T Tavern. And I think anybody that was at that gig, you know, just knew that this is it. I mean, I mean, the first groundbreaking gigs were like, you know, early DOA gigs and, you know, Necro gigs and the first couple of Meat Men shows. And, uh, you know, but when Minor Threat came, everybody was like, whoa. And I think I think a lot of bands got formed that night. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you know, the skater kids are like, wow, man, you know, you know, because that that was just jaw dropping. And then, you know, like a little later, you know, the bad brains coming through and you know, black flag, just, you know, just the early stuff that was uh, just freaking everybody out and just, you know, Detroit loved all that stuff. You know? Yeah. That minor threat show seems sort of legendary. That's also where your, your drummer got beaten down by the he, DC. Uh, dudes, right? he, he was a goofy dude. He was always walking around with a drink in his hand, uh, trying to stage dive. He was, he was a nutball zoo here. Yeah. It, it was actually, actually the first incarnation of, uh, we all went to the same high school uh he, he was actually the first drummer in static oh, really? but, but the guitar player's like I, can, I think we did like a couple house parties with him and then you know the guitar player's like i, I can't deal with your friend john <laughs> you know but there, there was only, like i said about five punks in my high school and it, he, he had that early tribal thing going on so we got rid of him and then you know we got this other guy red to play a little a little more uh could play better beats but uh yeah, it was it was something. God, you know, I was totally freaked out because, uh, you know, like oh, minor threats coming to town. You know, we get to meet all these guys because you know we had the forty fives and you know you know whatnot. And, uh, he did something like he bumped into uh, 
you know, Alec was there. Yeah, I know. think he hit Alec, or that's what Ian he, says he, he hit Alec, I he, think. It wasn't into, it wasn't like he hit him. Okay. I think he did like some staged, he was a big guy. I think he did like some goofy stage dive and landed on him and kind of knocked him over. So Wrong person. Point, it, yeah, yeah. It, and then, it, you know, you know, you know Pete, me and Pete were like, minor threat's going to kill us. <laughs> the guy made the word on the street was like, that dude from negative approach. <laughs> you know, I mean, we laughed about it, you know, you know, like years later, you know, like me and an Alec or whatever. And it's kind of like, that was like, we've just started and we're over. Minor threat <laughs> wants to kill negative approach. You know, you know, you know. But, uh, you know, that was just one of those goofy things and yeah yeah you know, we eventually got rid of Zuber, yeah but, uh, well, that seems to be almost like the the next era of negative approach right when you get rid of him and and op and graham join well just i mean you know me and pete zaleski um basically started the band and you know we had zoo hair and, and, and you know before we had rob on guitar it was just the three of us mm. and at that point we were writing all you know you know we had a bunch of the early songs you know, you know, together just as a three piece. And then uh, we eventually got Rob to come in and then, you know, and kind of like we, we did gigs, we did gigs with that lineup and then, you know, Pete, he kind of, you know, he kind of wanted to go on and do something else. So Pete started this band called the allied. So, you know, he, he wanted to go in a different direction. So at that point, uh, Rob's like, well, why don't I get my little brother to play bass and Opie? And they had this band youth patrol. They were actually, you know, on that first process of elimination single so when they came into it then we really started kind of getting all the songs together for you know the first ep and stuff and, and at that point you know opie you know chris moore he, he he had a bunch of riffs so you know he he, he was uh he was a guitar player became a drummer so mm -hmm. you know he kind of you know you know he's responsible for you know writing a lot of those classic riffs you know yeah and it's just it's uh it's really at that point, I guess, that the Detroit hardcore thing's really going, right? Like, it, and, and I even guess when it gets big, it's not even that many people, ultimately, right? Like a few hundred. It was hundred. always a handful of people. People always think it was like, yeah, you know, this is, you know, even, uh, even at its peak, that everybody has this illusion that, you know, the freezer theater holds 5,000 people. I mean, at the most, that was like maybe 150 kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I it, it's hard to put a number on it, but like, I, I really got to say it started out with, started out with about seven, seven of us. Then it was became 12. And then, you know, as the ball got rolling, maybe it was 50. And then kind of like, you know, you know, the peak of the freezer theater, you know, when the misfits were playing there and, uh, that couldn't have been more than 150 kids. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't get that many people in there. You know, you know, it's like everybody has this illusion that like there's thousands of people. I mean, at that point, punk was still, you know, people weren't, you know, people weren't getting the hardcore thing. Yeah. You know, they, they, it, it was totally like it was still like, you know, punk sucks and dub these dudes with the shaved heads and you know, you know, it wasn't that ex it was still kind of like on it was pretty underground. I gotta say like 81, you know, you know, it's not accepted how it is, you know, like how it is today, mm -hmm. like, like the norm. I mean, you know, the norm today or be like, do something completely opposite. Cause you know, everybody's wearing the uniform and has the look and, you know, it's all laid out for you. I yeah. mean, at that point, it, you know, it, you know, it's, it, it was different. It was different for people just to see us hanging out and try to accept it, you know, which they didn't. You know, well, there's that famous story, I guess, that they kind of tell in that documentary again, where like, say, I think it's the last show of the freezer where Minor Threat plays, hmm. and there's like tons of people show up, and the cops pull up, and there's like a huge fight, and the cops pull up on the fight, and are just like, we have no idea what the fuck this is, and just roll out without arresting anyone, without breaking up the fight or anything. That was yeah, that that was like nuts. That that was kind of like right when it. It just kind of, you know, I don't want to say, you know, the outsiders started coming in or people that really weren't getting the people were attracted to, uh, you know, the punk thing and, you know, black flag. Cause it, you know, they, you know, they thought it was like a license to come to gigs to beat people up and, mm. you know, you know, that's, that's right at the beginning where it 
kind of started getting a little stupid where, you know, it kind of started out with a bunch of, you know, creative people and, you know, you know, you know, the, the idea of going to shows wasn't to like go beat somebody up. And so, you know, there was two factions of people that, you know, I, I don't know the exact story. Like somebody said some shit to somebody's girlfriend. So, you know, two groups of people just got in this all out brawl. And it's like, you know, that was kind of like, that was the kind of start where, you know, shows started becoming a drag, you know, yeah. it's like, we, you know, we really didn't start it, you know, started out to like turn into this. It was kind of like, kind of like when the, you know, other people, like their concept of what hardcore was started kind of coming in and kind of like the beginning of the end for Detroit. Cause Detroit just got, it got really bad. It was really violent. And, you know, that was part, you know, that was part of the reason for, you know, the original NA guys to leave. They're just, you know, every gig we did was just like, just people getting beat up for no reason. You know, you know, you know, you know, it was like, you know, fake skinhead dudes showing up and especially in Detroit, there was this whole faction of uh, people that just got, you know, they all thought they were like in the national front and, had the swastika tattoos and show up to our gigs and what you know they weren't even into music yeah. it was just, it was just you know it was just like a, you know you know an invitation to come and like beat up the people and the funny thing they you know somebody had like long hair or looked different they would uh you know they'd always single them out and beat them up and stuff but the funny thing is when they all you know started coming to our shows these were the dudes with long hair and jean jackets with a judas priest shirt on they were like the jean jacket suburban kids that saw a couple necro gigs or, you know, you know, negative approach shows. And then like two weeks later, they're like, you know, totally oi boys. and They got British accents. And it was like, oh my, oh my God, man, this is like, this is ridiculous. Is that what led you to grow your hair out again back then? Originally? No, I was probably seeing the birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> really early birthday but it was funny it was funny because there's pictures of like nick cave and me i'm bald yeah. right, right before like tie down came out and uh there's actually like some pictures of detroit uh you know larissa's band l7 warmed up the birthday party this was like god man it was like 83 and then you know you know you know they had just released you know the bad cdp and it was like you know they play this place tracks in detroit and it was, you know, that was a life changing gig for me, you know, you know, and then I was like, oh, my God, Nick Cave this is like, oh, my God, you know, this is the shit. I think I started growing my hair out the day after I saw that show, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, that, you know, and, and you know, the whatever, you know, you don't want to shave, you know, we shaved the heads in the, in the beginning. It was just kind of like, yeah, you know, this kind of shocking punk rock where, you know, we're American kids and then, you know. You know, you know the the kids that started doing it, kind of, you know, adopting that. You know, I'm in the national front. You know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm English. You know, it, was, it, it kind of strayed me away from that too. I was just like, ah, you know, now it's kind of, you know, not it's cool. Over. Yeah, not cool. You know, it felt like because you guys record that LP, and then it takes a long time for it to come out, right? Like it's like a, a six months, a year before it comes out after recording. Yeah, I mean, Touch and Go was still kind of starting out as a label. Yeah, and then it was like I don't know what the problems was, but Corey, Corey was uh, still trying to find pressing plants and printers and all that. You know, there was kind of like the beginning stages of uh, doing Touch and Go records. Uh, it was just there might've been problems with the test pressings and we had it send it back. And then, you know, at that point trying to get, you know, records from a pressing plant was like months and months and months. Yeah. So, I mean, it really came, you know, recorded in 83, but I think it came out in 84. And I mean, a year between that and hardcore is like, you know, Oh, well, we're I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of space in between, you know, well, it's wild when you think about like, I was thinking about this today when you're, you're talking about the static, it's 79 and then NA's over by 84. It's like five years. Like, that's just like five years that changed the world. Oh, <laughs> just, uh, I guess we were at the right place at the right time. Yeah, but, well, but you gotta look. You gotta look at both bands. Nobody, you know, we both those bands started out. Everybody hated us. Nobody dug it. 
I mean, it, you know, we'll see what happens with the static. You know, I still have nightmares thinking, uh, you know, it's you, there's a couple of advanced copies out, but I'm still waiting for uh, the Lester Bang review. <laughs> what, what, he, what, what he did, on the, you know, the first Alice Cooper album, Pretty for You, where I was like, you know, the, the, the one sentence review, a tragic waste of plastic, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, that's, you know, that's still, you know, has to be determined what people think of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and now it's kind of like, kind of like, well, this is, you know, this is a time frame thing. So, you know, like over time, you know, people are really going to be like, they get it or they don't, or just, you know, maybe people that are interested in my other records want to see where it started. What, was it like that with the hyenas too? When the hyenas started, did people, people not get hated it? Hated the hyenas. Oh my god! Because that was like when we first came out. We did this in our first couple. Of our actually, our, the first hyenas gig was kind of cool because uh, we just moved to Ann Arbor and stuff. And uh, our next door neighbor was Michael Davis from the MC Five. Oh, awesome! And that was that was my buddy. That was my buddy. We hung out like every day, and and, and you know, destroy all monsters recorded in his basement. And I, and I remember when we first moved in there, I was walking down the block. This is before I knew they lived there. I was walking down the block um, trying to go to the party store down that we just moved in, We're moving in. And I was like, oh, I got to go get a 40, you know, where I'm packing and stuff. And then I hear this guitar and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm walking. I'm like, what the fuck is that? I go, who the fuck does this dude think he is, Ron Ashton? <laughs> and then I didn't know that a couple <laughs> weeks later when I realized they were, you know, it was Ron Ashton. So, <laughs> They practiced right next door to us. Oh, that's and, awesome. And they, they actually gave us our first gig at uh, Joe Star Lounge. And uh, God, I think it was like, oh, it was like 85, 85 at uh, yeah, um, Joe Star Lounge and Royal Monsters. And I think about our third gig, we actually opened up for Black Flag in like 85. It was, it was right towards the end of them. I think they were doing that, you know, who's got the 10 and a half. So, you know, it's a total, and, and I think what happened, whoever Black Flag was touring with that, I don't know, you know, like Painted Willie or, you know, like Tom Tricoli's dog, yeah. somehow one of those bands didn't make it, that you know, their van broke down on the way to the tour, so they didn't have an opener. So uh, they called us up to go, you know, oh, I was laughing, I just want to open up for Black Flag, and I go, well, we're not really ready. You know, you know, because we had only done like a couple shows. We only had a couple songs. So I remember when we opened up for Black Flag, and then people saw me come out. And people hadn't seen me for a while because I moved to Ann Arbor. And, you know, I had the long black hair. People was like, "Ooh, this isn't," you know. <laughs> and, then, and then as soon as I came out, you know, everybody's yelling out the negative approach songs. And then as soon as we started going into that, you know, the early versions of like the hyena songs, people were like, "I don't like this. I get it at all." So, I mean, that was really like people, I think people really wanted me to go on and, uh, you know, do negative approach to, you know, you know, at yeah. that point. And, you know, we were on a whole different wavelength at that point, you know, to, uh, you know, at that point we were kind of like, you know, the original hardcore thing was just kind of over as far as we we're concerned. And we were getting into different kinds of music and stuff. So well, I wanted to, you know, start something completely different, you know? Yeah, no, and it feels like that 80, 83 84 and 85 was like the years like well dino those guys start you know like it feels like there's a shift with a lot of people that were into the first wave of hardcore or kind of the architects of the first wave of hardcore yeah. starting to do different things even in dc right like they start doing revolution summer shortly thereafter right so it feels like there was uh there were some people that went on past the hardcore thing do interesting things yeah and yeah. it just yeah i mean at that, that point we were just on a different path you know but you know it, like pfft. Like every every band I've ever you know as soon, every new band I've ever put out it's like as soon as we start people are like oh, I don't like this I don't get it it seems people can always catch up to you know the records I've done twenty years after the fact they're like oh that's pretty good I mean it, I still got the hardcore kids discovering the hyenas yeah because you know, when that you know when that came out it's like oh it's John Brandon's art band that ain't no good and then like twenty years later they're like. You know, you know, see some kid, you know, post some stuff and be like, yeah, when this stuff came out, I didn't give it the time of the day, but it's pretty cool. You know, you know they grew yeah. up a little bit and they're like, oh, it's different. You know, it's something different. You know? Well, because you have so much nostalgia attached to stuff when you discover it that you become so protective over it. You know, like you just can't open your mind to someone else changing because, you know, it's almost like a, a security thing, you know, over a certain era of someone's career. Like you yeah, cling to it. Yeah. Uh, 
What was uh I want to ask you a question. Uh how did you meet Laura Lee? She was your roadie, right? For a while with Negative Approach. That was well, it was she used to cut, you know. Oh god. Uh yeah, she was. I'm trying, I'm trying to put it all together, uh, timeline. Um that was actually okay. We had released Tied Down. Tied Down finally comes out. All the other the, the guys that played on it, the original guys, the mm-hmm. brothers and OP, they had quit. They had quit at that point. So the record finally comes out months later. And then Corey, you know, Corey from Touch and Go, he's like, you know, he's like, John, I'm putting out this record. What what are you gonna do? I go, What do you mean? What are we gonna do? <laughs> Those guys all quit. I don't have a band. So I kind of it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like total pressure, but he was kind of putting pressure on me, like. Well, you guys, you got to promote this album. I go, I don't have a band. So I kind of, you know, kind of handpicked some guys from the local scene and kind of, you know, I always call it the fake NA, even though there's been, you know, a million, you know, versions of NA. Um, kind of, you know, they could play the songs and we kind of went out and did, you know, the ill fated tie down tour because it could, you know, it's kind of getting some pressure to promote the album. Mm-hmm. So, like those guys, they, you know, you know, you know, I remember Laura before these guys, but uh, you know, it'd always be like at the last, you know, you know, towards the end end of NA gigs. But uh one of the one of the guys was really good friends with her. Mm-hmm. So and we actually ended up uh rehearsing in her basement, you know, you know, for you know, we did that us uh, 84 summer tour, which you know, it was supposed to be like a six-week tour, which only lasted about three weeks because the drummer we had at that point um he flipped out and quit i remember we did our last gig in memphis and you know and it was about a week away we had all these gigs like scheduled with the big boys and you know we were going out to la play with like the toy dolls and the effigies and you know these these huge gigs in la golden voice gigs or whatever and you know we broke up in memphis right before you know we made it out to that so at that point you know i'm thinking like well i try to you know we did like East Coast shows and kind of some down south shows. At that point, I was like, ah, neg approach is over. So at that point, you know, Larissa's band, L7, had broke up too. And at that point, I'm like, I, I can't do NA anymore. It's just, you know, I tried. I tried to keep it together. So at that point, you know, that was kind of like, you know, Larissa and I was like, well, maybe we should start a band. And that's, you know, when we started talking about putting the hyenas together, you know. Yeah. Wait, did that did you have any plans for continuing negative approach to record more at first with these other guys? Like, where'd you think the sound would have gone? I, I would hope, I would hope. Cause it, and, 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 well, it just kind of freaked me out that, you know, they were just kind of getting, well, at that point they were kind of just disillusioned from the scene and they, they wanted to write different kind of music. Yeah. You know, they, they went off to uh, other bands and stuff. And, uh, you know, but it was just kind of like those things like, well, you got, you know, my thing, my thing was like, you guys want to break up at our peak. I go, we're just getting started here. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know what would have happened if we stayed together and wrote another record. Cause they were they were definitely getting into other 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 forms of music. You know, at that point I was I was getting into the birthday party and you know, you know, yeah. Listening to the suicide and the cramps and you know that, you know, that kind of thing. And they, they were kind of like leaning more towards a pop direction. Yeah. Which uh well cross wires was was well, that's Christmas. What, yeah well they they kind of went in that direction so, so i mean it was kind of like i mean as far as negative approach i wanted to get more you know violent <laughs> and just maybe you know see, see what we would you know what, what, you know what would have come out after that but they you know they were you know they were veering off and i was veering off so you know it wasn't you know it wasn't four guys sitting in a room you know with the, the same mindset it just wasn't there so mm-hmm. you know they went off to do what they did and i went off to do what i did you know because there's like uh, you know like i love the album obviously and uh, but first here first time hearing it evacuate was always a song that bothered me and then i've grown to love it where it's one of my favorite negative approach songs i hated that song i hated that song so much that was an opie riff yeah and that, that was my least favorite um <sighs> It, it, it that's another weird thing like when negative pro when we started doing the reunion gigs it was kind of like that was the one song i kept out of the set list 
and everybody's like evacuate and i'm like no we'll never play that song and then it you know this is when you know opie was still playing drums with us and then we tried it one day and we kind of sped it up just a little bit a little different groove and then i'm like ah eh. i mean we do it now but that, that was like one of my least favorites and that that that, that was a straight up you know opie riff right there but your vocals are so different on that song too. Like you, you it looks like you took a different approach. You know, you're like hitting it at a much higher register, and it's like so much more screechy. You know, and it, it's it obviously you do stuff like that in the hyenas later on. You bring it into your other vocal stuff, but like that performance of that song just stands out in such a weird way on that record. Like, yeah, I was kind of just kind of becoming a stronger singer, mm -hmm. and just maybe you know my voice was instead of you know doing that you know that. Uh, yeah, I you know, it just maybe I was is stretch my vocal cords out a little bit. So, you know, maybe that kind of leaned more towards what would uh, become the hyenas, you know. You were at the uh SNL show, right? The Saturday Night Live Fear show? Yeah. yeah. How how did you kind of wind up at that show? Were you in New York hanging out I, or uh no, it's like this thing uh the necro, you know, I, the necros would always do gigs in New York. And I'd always kind of like tag along, you know, they'd always be like, you know, Corey would be like, give me 20 bucks for gas and you can jump in the back seat. You know, you know, <laughs> so they'd load up the shit. And, you know, I'd always, you know, in theory, roadie for the Necros. I'd you know, basically just hanging out with them. Um, they were playing with the Misfits at uh, Irving Plaza, which was like Devil's Night and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we went to that gig and, then, you know, Belushi came to the gig. And it was kind of weird because my minor threat were all in town. Because I, I think they had just played the night before, maybe Gildersleeves or mm -hmm. I don't think it was CBs, but just the whole kind of DC crew was all up in there. And then it, it was kind of like, uh, you know, along with the Necro, you know, Tesco, we all, you know, we all just drove out with the Necros and Belushi came to the gig. He's like, oh, oh you know, I'm going to have, you know, uh, fear on Saturday Night Live. So he kind of. You know, we we're all kind of hanging out on the side of stage, you know, the minor threat dudes and, you know, necros and all that. And he's like, I want you guys to come down to Saturday Night Live and cause some shit. And <laughs> we basically got us all in there. And uh, yeah, we did that. That was kind of exciting, but it was kind of, you know, it was kind of weird. It was kind of like the new cast of Saturday Night Live and nobody knew who any of those people were and stuff. And they invited us down there and, uh, you know, I'd never been to a filming of uh, a TV show. You know, when they do Saturday Night Live, they do it a couple hours before the actual airtime. They go through the whole show. Mm -hmm. So they kind of did this test run of the show where they, they do a practice run. And, uh, you know, it was all the DC kids and, you know, you know, uh, you know just, you know, just a bunch of people. And uh, I remember, you know, Sab from Iron Cross. And I remember they, they kind of did the test run and we were kind of doing our fake, you know, you know, stage diving and slam dancing. And I remember him and me like bumped into a camera, you know, and I, we knocked into one of the, 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 the TV cameras and I guess we broke some tubes and stuff. So they were kind of like, ah, oh, they were like, they didn't know if they wanted the group of people. That was the test run. And, you know, you know, the, the next day on the paper, well, next you know uh, punks invade nbc studios hundred thousand dollars worth of damage <laughs> i don't know you know like hundred dollars worth of radio tubes or something but they really kind of blew that out but i think you know that was like one of those you know right place at the right time you know just uh you know you know just i happen to be in new york and you know that was kind of exciting we got to see fear and everybody kind of you know might have been america's first glimpse of who are these hardcore kids? And then, you know, then of course, you know, you know, we're, they're filming that and the mic drops in front of me. So of course I have to say negative approach is going to fuck you up. And I was so embarrassed. I said that. And Ian was standing right next to me and I'd say it, you know, I had it to him and he's like, New York sucks. It felt like a, it felt like a minor threat song or something. And then at that point, you know, they had pumpkins on the stage and the DC kids were picking up the pumpkins. And I think they, kind of turned off the episode to america that it, they kind of cut it on the live feed and did it's they just funny. it's just one of those things that was funny you know? did they throw you guys out right afterwards type thing where they're like get the hell out of here you punks they were kind of no it wasn't it wasn't that bad but we were asked to leave immediately <laughs> you know just 
leave now. I mean, I, you know, they didn't call the cops on us or anything, but I think it was just like, you need to leave now. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. Well, it's funny because there's like always it's brought up on the show and it's come up a ton over the years. There's that divide, obviously, between D.C. and Boston and New York, you know, where like stuff from New York didn't necessarily fly as much. Like obviously Agnostic Front and like there were connections between a lot of these bands as well. But like it feels like there were divides, whereas Detroit, it feels like there's a lot like you guys could kind of go anywhere and we're, we're cool with everybody. We were kind of neutral. I guess we were the Sweden of that whole thing. Um yeah you know i never i never tried to get in the middle of all that thing but i i knew there was just kind of like you know factions were like you know fuck new york you know fuck boston but i mean i i gotta say the dc detroit thing was you know that we were always kind of like yeah you know because we kind of all met each other early on and you know like i said detroit just you know just loved the discord shit Mm -hmm. but you know you know i guess you know like i said the boston bands the new york bands came through it'd be, we'd be kind of like eh. you know we, we we didn't appreciate it as much as we did uh dc you know but then like the misfits you know when i have people from dc on they always are like yeah the misfits but like you know the misfits were huge in detroit and obviously had this really strong connection i gotta, to I gotta really say you know they might have even broken detroit because detroit yeah. just loved the misfits and there was always you know a connection with the necros and the misfits and uh you know, it, 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 you know, the misfits were like huge in Detroit. They just loved that shit. And then, yeah. you know, you know, I, I, and, and they started getting a little popular. And then, I, then I know that you know, there's a whole faction of like, you know, like the hardcore dudes, like, well, fuck those dudes, they're Kiss. You know, you know, you know, <laughs> you had that going on. But you know, we love the misfits. You know, the early shit. I mean, you know, they always played Detroit and. uh well, it makes sense because it's like it is kind of like Alice Cooper. It is kind of like Kiss, and like not necessarily a negative way, but I mean in the same sort of way that it's theatrical. They always, they always appreciated anything like that, you know. You know, Kiss, Kiss broke in Detroit, and the Dolls were like really, you know, at that time, you know, were really accepted. You know, we had Alice Cooper and mm -hmm. Stooges, so that was kind of like that was kind of the norm for us. I mean, we're you know we're cool with that. And DC plays down the theatrics, but DC, DC is very theatrical. Like a lot of those bands are very dramatic. It just, I think they don't like the. Oh, yeah, it's iconic, man. Just <laughs> yeah. the, the e, early Ian gigs or just, you know, if, if anybody that got a witness an early Bad Brains gig, new hands down, that that guy, you know, this is like, you know, is on a par with like Iggy, you know, yeah. nothing, you know, the funhouse period. I mean, you know, that's one of the greatest you know, performers of all time is HR, you know. Well, who are your favorite front people? Like, who are, like, the people that you look at as being, like, iconic to you? Well, I got to go, you know, it's 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 all going to go back to Detroit. I mean, yeah. I mean, my favorites are, like, Al early Alice Cooper. I mean, mm -hmm. let's specify that. Um, early Stooge Ziggy, Nick Cave, Lux Interior. I mean, just all the good ones, you know, mm -hmm. just all the, all the killer front mans. And I, you know, again, I gotta go back. Oh, Ian McKay, minor threat. Seeing those shows were just like, you know, HR, you know, stuff that I've witnessed that, yeah. you know, I saw live that, you know, this, you know, those, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. It's funny. Cause like Nick cave is someone that, you know, I, I think there's a lot of parallels between you and Nick Cave, like in your careers, like the fact that both you guys were in first wave bands, were in second wave bands, were in third wave bands, and ultimately kind of like are still doing stuff that's relevant, you know, like there's really uh, a lot of parallels that can be drawn, like because there's very few people that do that, right? Like very few people are able to kind of keep doing stuff that matters. Cave, I mean, you know, if anybody's seen him perform at any period, I got I got to say, Everybody's like, what's the last really great show you've seen? And I go, last time I saw Nick Cave <laughs> in Detroit. And then like, well, what other show before that it was like, just really, you know, inspiring. And I go, probably the time before the last time Nick Cave <laughs> came. Because, you know, play, you know, he's just one of those guys that just, you know, even, you know, even though, you know, the bad seas isn't the birthday party, but he just, he just brings it to the live performance. You can't even mess with that, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and it takes, you know, I've seen so many gigs. It takes, you know, a lot for me to like go, wow, you know, you know, 
you know they just yeah. like, you know every time i've seen the cramps lux you know i you know i just you know i like that crazy energy man you know just people that are just like just pushing it man they're still fucking great you know it's funny talking to people that knew the cramps or like you know or around those people just how real that is like you know i think a lot of people would think that was a stage show or something but those people like lux and ivy they lived it 24 7 from the sounds oh. of like <laughs> the the hyenas got to play with the cramps you know at cbgb's oh that's that, awesome. that, that was like amazing oh my god <laughs> we were so like intimidated we were like you talk about fear factor you know it's, it's lux that's lux man <laughs> you know you know you know but they were fucking amazing that was yeah. uh I can't remember. it was in the 90s so it was it was kind of like right when they started talking about shutting down cbgb's but it didn't happen you know right away but uh yeah yeah we you know we got to play with the cramps and you know I, i'd go see them all the time in detroit when they play mm. those, those are always like great shows you know i don't think hyenas get the credit that you guys deserve for being that proto grunge band or being that band that kind of helps usher in that alternative thing because obviously you're on a different coast and it's not brought up in that conversation, but you listen to those first hyenas records like that is completely what other bands would start doing a few years later. Eh, well, like not like the I, same, obviously, but doing something. Different. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, we never really. I think, well, first of all, I think a lot of people were turned off by my voice. I mean, we were not coming from like, you know, it was kind of going on right at that point it was kind of like, uh, you know, the alternative pop sound. I mean. We're not coming from, you know, you know. Don't sound like Michael Stipe. We, yeah, we don't like the Beach Boys and the Beatles. We're coming from, you know, the Stooges and, you know, <laughs> you know, birthday party. I mean, I mean, it, you know, that that kind of thing that was kind of going on, you know, what they call like college rock. Yeah. It, it, I think it's before they call it alternative. It's called college rock. Yeah. So we were kind of like, you know, the anti that what was going on. And we weren't trying to write pop songs. You know, you know, you know, and just, uh, you know, I just, I, I think the concept of what we were trying to do just kind of turned a lot of people off. I mean, you know, you know, we had like a, uh, like a cult following, mm -hmm. you know, but I think we might have turned a lot of people off. Yeah, <laughs> you know, were you, were you guys ever approached by a major label? Yeah, during, during that signing period, was that just something that you had no interest in, yeah. or? We considered it, but we decided no because we wanted to say well. Just there was this label called Interscope. Mm -hmm. Right when they were starting out, they approached us. It, you know, they became some huge fucking label. Yeah, you know, yeah. You were that, or oh yeah, they did like Eminem and Nine Inch Nails, and this is right when they were starting out. They sent us like this, like kind of form letter saying we are a new company called Interscope, and we we're approaching you because we we're looking for exciting new bands. I mean, it was kind of, I think it was kind of before they became like, you know, you know, whatever they can. And, and that, you know, that was kind of like, ah, okay. Okay. But at, you know, at that point we're still holding on to our, you know, we're independent, man. We're touch and go, man. We're not leaving touch and go. But then yeah. again, you know, we never really sold a lot of records back then. So, you know, we kind of didn't get the push as uh you know the other touch and go bands at that point we're always kind of like on the you know the bottom of the totem pole you know and 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 i just you know at that period when we came out i don't i don't think people really kind of got what we were trying to do and you know maybe they just thought we sucked <laughs> you know that's, yeah i don't know i just think maybe it's too real you know like that's the thing that's also about it it's just like it is like you're saying your voice is is obviously your voice so it's it's harsher than a lot of stuff that was on the radio at the time but there's just like i don't know it just it just feels like it's not a metal band playing slow down grungy riffs you know like it's this is like this is your sound because these are who you are as people we yeah well yeah i mean it was definitely who we were i mean and we really weren't you know we weren't really weren't trying to fit in or cater to anything mm -hmm. i mean we're it, you know at that point you know, with the hyenas, I finally felt, you know, free. I finally, you know, I, I was in a room with people that were all on the same page and we had similar interests because it was like, you know, every band I've been in, it's always kind of, you know, trying to convince somebody to, hey, well, check out this. Why don't we, you know, let's explore this. And it was always, you know, fighting against band members to, uh, you know, you know, try to do, you know, try to do some, you know, kind of style or something. But, you know, with the hyenas, it was, you know, 
we were definitely, you know, it was the first time we were all on the first page where we could all hang out together and listen to the same records and talk about music. And, you know, it was right when we, you know, we moved to Ann Arbor. We all lived together. It was like the monkey. You know, you know, you know, you know we all had the house together. We're all trying to scramble to pay the rent and, you know, do a gig. And, but, you know, we were all like on the same page, you know. Well, like also going around at that time, like there's so much weird stuff happening. Like obviously you got that sort of noise rock pig fuck scene. Sometimes it's called in New pig York. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Did Lydia Lunch make that up? I don't think so. I, she, I, I don't think she, I, I don't think, think she likes it very much when it's called that. <laughs> it seems like that was like a description that kind of came out of, you know, the New York, maybe New York fanzine or something. I don't know if Lydia came up with that term or, you know, maybe <laughs> describing pussy galore or, you know the pig fuck yeah I, did, I, I always thought that was hilarious i was like what the fuck but it's like also at the same time you have all the stuff that's happening in dc with like you know rights of spring ending and fugazi starting and that whole stuff yeah. and like you guys can you guys played with all those bands like you guys could fit into all those worlds weirdly and not fit in any we other. were still like all friends with those guys you know you know from the hardcore scene and i gotta say uh we had just you know released the first uh hyenas album merry-go-round mm -hmm. and um you know, we're still, you know, we're still friends with, you know, the Discord people and Ian and all that. I remember Fugazi did one of their first shows, uh, warming up the hyenas. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you know, it's like uh DC space. And you know, uh, Ian, Ian was a huge hyenas fan. Actually, he just called me the other day because some guy's doing a book and he, he wanted my blessings because he's like, is this guy legit? He goes, This guy called me up, <laughs> wants to interview me about the hyenas. I go. I go, yeah, he's cool, man. He's on the level. I go, it should be painless, man. I go, go for it. And he texted me back, okie dokie. <laughs> but but, but then, then he kind of put a text, you know, you know, I love the hyenas, man. How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, dude, I got, you know, I was like, I gotta, I gotta send you the static record, you know, so <laughs> you should be getting that in the mail in a minute. But, um, you know, we're still in touch with those guys, even though we don't see each other all the time. It's kind of like, just cause we all kind of came early on in the beginning scene where everybody was like really close and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you could not see these guys for years and then you run into them and you can just strike up a conversation. Like you just saw them yesterday, you know, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's, and, and you got and Nirvana open for you guys too, right? No, 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 they actually, well, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> they never opened, but we knew those dudes. And when they played Ann Arbor, they'd crash at our house. Yeah. I mean, it was just shit like that. And then it's like they would come to the hyenas gigs in like New York and shit. And then, it, you know, remember, you know, Kurt came up to me one day or, you know, it was bad. We were playing with Sonic Youth the Mud Honey at the, the Ritz or whatever. And, uh, you know, Kurt's, uh, he comes up and he goes, oh, I really dig the hyenas sound, man. And they were on tour with Tad. And yeah. Then, and then Tad comes up and he goes, he goes, I gave Kurt that mirror ground album, you know, you know. <laughs> and he, he's like, he goes, I really, he's like, I really like Sonic Records. I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. I go, you should go check out my guy, Butch Vig. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that that kind of happened, and you know, I I don't think I need to go into that anymore. No, the rest is history on that one. But but the funny, you know, we're we're going into Butch's at Smart Studios to kind of, um, you know, we're we're setting up the equipment to record Life of Crime. And, and Butch just got done record, recording Nevermind. And he goes, he goes, oh, I just recorded, I just recorded with uh, Nirvana. And I, and I was kind of like, oh, they hooked up with you. Cool, man. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't know what they just did. <laughs> yeah. he, goes, he goes, he goes, why you guys are setting up your equipment? He goes, I got the tapes and he was trying to do the mix. He goes, I think this is going to be the first single. And, I, and he goes, do you mind if I play it and fuck around with this while you guys are setting up your gear? I go, I don't care, man. And it, dude, it's like smells like teen spirit. <laughs> and I was like, I remember we were all kind of like, this sounds pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I go, this guy sounds like the Pixies or something. You know, you know, you know it's kind of like, you know, we had no idea what the fuck he was playing. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of like one of those things, like, you know, you look back on and you laugh, you know. But like yeah. when you when you listen to Nirvana, you do hear that that the hyenas would have been an influence. Like early on, like eighty seven, when you hear that, I can't. I can't say that. I can't say. You that. don't think you don't hear it when you, li you listen to them on any level. Not that I'm aware of. I, they had their own thing going on. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, that was so like 
that was just you know to me that's just them you know you know mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, and I'm not saying they're like a hyenas clone band or anything, but I can hear that in there. Like the same way I hear the wipers in there, the same way I hear the pixies, as you said, in there. Like they, 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 they were did. definitely listening to us. The fact yeah. that you know, you know, that Curve was like, ah, oh, dig your records, and you know, they come and play in Ann Arbor, and they crash me, me and Larissa's apartment. At that point, we had like an, we didn't have the hyena house anymore, but you know, they, you know, they crash on the floor on the sleeping bags after playing the Blind Pig in Ann Arbor. <laughs> yeah. And, and be funny, which is another thing. Like Kurt's like, can I check out your records? I'm like, yeah. You know, you go through the stack. Of course, he pulls out the lead belly. <laughs> Where did you sleep last night? And then I go to him. I go, yeah, me and Larissa want to do a cover of that. And of course, he's playing that shit. <laughs> and then you know, this is when they, you know, they were torn out bleach and shit. Of course, you know, they went, you know, you can't even touch that song now. No. <laughs> but what I just saw that was funny, too. You know, that he play that record, you know. I, I want to hear you do that still. I, I don't care that they've done it. I want to hear yeah. you sing that song. That's when, me, that's when the hyenas, we were really, you know, we were really into the fucking blues. I mean, we, you know, we, we're going through our, you know, our John Lee Hooker, Lead Belly, you know, Holland Wolf thing, mm-hmm. which, we, we, you know, was kind of like the late 80s, you know, really discovering the blues and buying all the <laughs> records and playing them and, you know. Have you ever thought about doing like uh like doing like a stripped down just your voice and guitar record or doing like your voice and piano type record like nick cave does like have you ever thought about trying that? uh we just haven't got there you know but maybe yeah, yeah. i mean i wouldn't be opposed to it. it like i didn't it wasn't until i watched you like obviously you know fan of your voice on every level but like watching you do just sort of like a straight up clean blues vocal at that dinosaur junior jam session uh i was oh, kind of like that, that was kind of ad lib but i was like i'm just like i'd love to hear you take that voice and put it into a context like that you know like i think it'd be really interesting to hear it, it, it's kind of funny because you know after we all hung out michael Parallelli, um he texted me yeah was, you know he's like john it's great hanging out with me and he goes he goes he goes you're the john lee hooker of hardcore <laughs> and yeah. i thought that was funny as shit you know <laughs> Uh, it was amazing and then i I, i'm like why is he saying that oh i forgot we were that was kind of a drunken night we kind of went into all those blues jams at the end with you know the little kids playing along and yeah yeah that was was kind of funny it was kind of funny the next morning looking over at you hanging out with christopher from from the sopranos taking a picture that made that whole trip worthwhile like oh, I, so... look pretty, I look pretty hit in that photo. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, this has been amazing, John. And I could talk to you for hours. And I know you got to get stuff going because you're going on tour soon. But uh, anytime you want to come back here, man, I'd love to talk to you more. Yeah, man. Give me some updates. Maybe maybe there'll be some real drama after this tour. Oh, my God. There's so much yeah. stuff to get to. But uh, before I let you go, I got to ask you about a band that I'm sure you have some stories about. But they are a, a turn it a punk favorite to ask about slaughterhouse on depression records did you ever any experience uh, with that band yes and i heard harold just on the way to practice i don't know the guy's name i'm not it's not bob the singer but i guess the drummer or the drummer just died oh my gosh sorry to hear that um god i, I can't remember the name i remember the dude but uh, but he goes you remember blah 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 oh david stan this it's Zizky. the drummer yeah dude that was a conversation yesterday he goes, he goes harold's like remember that guy he's the drummer in slaughterhouse i go yeah i go they get you know the guy with the hair and you know you know had the leather on you know <laughs> you know i'm trying to describe but you know my memory of him and he goes, he goes yeah that guy just died oh and then, man yeah you know, I, well, I heard it was kovic he, he oh goes, wow yeah he, well harold's like yeah he was an anti-vaxxer you know you know whatever sad story but uh absolutely we uh the Highness did some early gigs with Slaughterhouse, and I was buddies with Bob. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, he was always a nut job because he would always like he would like do his shows, and he always be lighting his hair on fire. <laughs> It'd be like, uh, you know, and, and then I remember uh, years later, you know, Easy Action was doing shows. God, I, I think he, he was in, it was in San Francisco. He moved out to San Francisco. And Easy Action was doing shows out, and he come to the shows, and we're like, "Bob, what are you doing?" He's like, "Oh, I had to get out of Detroit." And I think he might have died too. I think I heard he passed away actually that not too that's long what ago. I, that's what I'm saying. So, uh, 
they they just seem to be a band that anyone I talk like Dave Pajo from Slint was on and he was saying that he saw them at CBGB's on the first Slint tour and it scarred him for life. Well, He's like it was the know, most they, be, they became another band. I don't know if you're aware, you know, after Slaughterhouse, they became a band called Cum Dumpster. Oh my god. They, what? They, they, uh, so so I mean, I you know, the legacy continued on that level. You know, <laughs> and they were uh Yeah, they were really out there trying to, you know, do their thing as it goes on it gets crazier in detroit like the stuff like during this era where it's like cum dumpster and cold as life and pitbull and like there just feels like it got it got heavier and heavier in the scene and weirder and weirder in different ways we i mean at that point we're living in ann arbor so you know you know the highness so we're kind of like you know when that cold as life thing came up you know that was kind of like you know, we were already doing the hyenas and stuff. Yeah, you know, that kind of came up in Detroit and uh, mm-hmm. Pitbull. I know those dudes, and uh, you know, we've done you know, done shows with them. But uh, yeah, you know, just you know, we were just kind of like in our own world in Ann Arbor, not really hanging out with anybody in the basement, trying to write some albums and oh. toured a lot. You know, you know. And and I guess one last thing I wanted to ask you about: uh, Can you tell me about being in the Terrence Malick film? You guys were in that. Oh my god! <laughs> which 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 they cut our scenes, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, I forgot. You know, I god. me and Harold were just talking about that the other day because we were trying to figure out how we could get the footage. If, yeah, if we were talking about. Um, they contacted us, and uh, we we're god, what was that? Was that South by Southwest or something? I or? think it was Fun 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 Fest, right? Or no, Fuck Yeah Fest. Or, or, or uh, I mean, one of the huge... Texas or one of them? Or, man, I'm trying to remember now. Fun Fun Fun. I think it was Fun Fun Fun. Either fun 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 or it was big outdoor fucking thing. You know, we were playing with like, you know, God, it was like, you know, Danzig, The Damned, uh, Public Enemy, Slayer. All, you know, just it was this big outdoor festival. And I remember the whole thing was a big dust bowl and everybody had bandanas you know because it was all muddy and the dust is flying all over big big outdoor thing in austin oh he was there filming some fucking movie who's that guy uh ryan gosling yeah ryan gosling yeah he was doing some new movie and they contacted us because i guess uh he wanted to film some you know this guy was it was supposed to be some kind of movie with the guy was in the music industry so he he went over the list of the bands and I guess his assistant, because you know, he didn't know who the hell we were. She showed him YouTube videos of all the bands on the festival. And then I guess he saw the negative approach footage, you yeah. know, whatever YouTube video. He goes, I want this guy. This guy is in the movie. I this this is the guy I want, which I thought was kind of funny because the guy has no concept of who we are, but I guess you like my moves, man. Well, that shows you that it's, it's 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 something that's objective. It's not subjective at all. It's like objectively a great performer. So go on. So. Even it, 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 so it was this whole thing where they had the camera set up. We're doing this big outdoor gig. You know the thing with the cherry pickers. You know it's like a movie set. Yeah, yeah. It was this whole fucking thing. Um, oh brother, this is this is going back. Um so ryan goss he's playing this character that i guess he's in the music industry so we're appearing as ourselves actually when we're doing the line check in front of like ten thousand people so it's kind of like they got the cherry pick action now you know you know they're filming all this shit so they got ryan goss and it totally looks like some hollywood geek he's got like blonde streaks in his hair and five thousand dollars cowboy boots on and probably you know two thousand dollar designer jeans i'm trying to look like he's dressing down making yeah clean, man so he's supposed to be my roadie so they they set him out we're actually like setting up the gear in front of the audience and they're filming and there's a whole you know the whole fucking crowds there you know we're, we're going on you know on, you know the dam were you know they were going on right next after us and uh he was supposed to be a roadie and terrence malley you know he's got the action you know he's got the megaphone he goes he goes stand next to him stand next to him. so he had to go up there and act like he was adjusting my mic stand you know like kind of putting my microphone on the mic stand yeah. filming all this shit and we're just kind of like setting up like doing our actual things so we're just about to play and then it, 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 and then some guy on the side he goes go up there i go what 
He goes, go, go stand next to Ryan. So I go, so I go up to the guy and I'm like, I go up to Ryan Gosling. He's like, he's like, you know, he's acting like so out of place, acting like he's a roadie and shit. I go, what's up, man? And I swear <laughs> he jumped like 10 feet. I like <laughs> the fuck out of him. And Harold was laughing, you know, because they're filming this. So, and then they fit, you know, they film part of, you know, our, our show and stuff. But um, I think he had some health issues and he scrapped part of the movie. And then he had to re resume filming it like two years later to finish mm-hmm. the movie. And then all our all our shit just got cut. You gotta and get that footage. I saw I bought the D, I bought it, found it used, and I bought it. I, I just thinking like we're gonna be in it. It was a horrible movie. I think I, like John Lydon's in it and Patty Smith. And I think they kind of like cut all our shit out, but the other, you know, there's a scene where he's walking through a hotel and Patty Smith's checking in or something. It's you know, I think it's called Song to Song. It, it's something like that. Okay. I gotta, we, were all, we were all excited what was going to happen. We're like, we're going to be in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> we need to start but, a Twitter uh, campaign. Release the Brandon cut. Release the Brandon cut of well, song to song. Like, well, Harold brought that up the other day. He goes, God, I wonder if we could ever get that footage. He goes, he goes when you walked up to Ryan Goss and said, what's up, man? And he goes, <laughs> he was terrified of you. And that, you know, I, you know, I got my game face on because I got all the people in front of me, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know, Mr. Brandon and shit. But uh, yeah, he just, it was just so funny how he looked so out of place. And they tried to, like I said, dress him down. Like he was like some kind of roadie yeah. or some guy in the music industry. And I was like, dude, you, you, you got Hollywood all over you, man. You don't, you don't belong here. You know, you know, but it was just, it was just hilarious. And I, you know, I thought it was funny as shit. They wanted, they wanted us to, you know, out of all the bands on that festival, they wanted to pick us to, you know, do the little scene. Terrence Malick's got great taste. That's what I, my takeaway is. Well, I dig his movies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> cut my scenes, man. Well, that's why I was. That wasn't very good. If he kept that in, it could be another Thin Red Line or something. Or another Badlands. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's the <laughs> shit right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. Well, so that was my, uh, that was my uh, moment on the Walk of Hall of Fame in Hollywood, which just did not happen. Well, John, you are on the permanent wall of this hall of fame forever and ever and anytime you want to come back here and talk more please know i i live for it oh i love you man leslie says hey thank you john for coming on the show and what up leslie can't wait to see both of you again in the near future and as you heard right there john will be coming back to the show at some point um because my gosh there's a lot more to talk about how cool was that? P- do yourself a favor. Check out that static recording ASAP. ASAP. Because uh, man, I'm going to listen to it as soon as I'm done recording this intro. And it's the middle of the night right now. I'm staying up very late to do this. So the last thing I need to do is throw on a record. But I kind of I kind of can't help myself right now. i got to listen to this thing. Uh, but before I let you go to jam that record out. Coming up on the next episode of the show, Mackie Chunks will be here. That's right, Mac from Super Chunk. That's my that's my nickname for him. I, I don't think he really likes it that much, but you know he's he's my he's my boss. You know, I'm, I'm on his label. That makes it on your boss. He kind of kind of does, I guess. Maybe I don't know, but he's my friend too, and I am so excited for you to hear this one. This is another episode that has taken forever to come together. But uh, I'm, I'm happy you get to hear it. And Mac's got a brand new solo record. Mac is one of my favorite songwriters. Everything he does, I love. This guy, he, he, one of the kings, one of the kings to me. And you will hear me talk to him in a, f- a few short days. So that is that. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of indigenous peoples matter. We need to protect trans kids. We need to help trans people protect themselves. We need to stop hate and violence towards Asian people and people of different faiths because all of that stuff isn't political. That's not political in the slightest. This is just basic human rights issues. Like the, the People just deserve to be free and to be able to live their lives without fear and, and prejudice imposed upon them. So get involved. Look at what's happening in the world around you. If there's an organization that's doing work that you agree with, 
contribute your time. You know, if you have money, contribute money and help out people that are doing work, you know, just, just have those conversations with people around you and, and just try, try. That's all we can do. Just try and make this world a better place. And we also can just say fuck off to Nazis because that's, that's just basic shit. Make your own culture because anyone can do this thing. You make a podcast, you make a fanzine, you make a record, whatever you're going to do. Anyone can do this shit. Maybe you just want to draw a couple pictures. You know, you don't have to share them with anyone, but doing something creative, expressing yourself, it, it can help your mental health. It really can. I, I promise you. Another thing that I can promise you is that meditation was something I did not fucking believe in at all. And now I, I, I do it and it, it's kind of working for me. So maybe try it for yourself. Not saying it's going to work, but maybe try it. Sign your organ donor cards because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need that shit. And I've seen it. I've seen it change people's lives firsthand. Well, I wasn't there when everything went down, but I've seen like the aftermath change people's lives. So signing those organ donor cards. And uh, I think I think that's it. Uh, stay safe. I will see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening. My God, did I love Negative Approach Week. And I will see you on the next episode.